Thank you for a very stimulating and uh, very wonderful overview. I think the idea is that the, there will be questions at the end, but if there are any, if there, there's time for, I think, one pressing question right now, if you would like. Um, oh, I see. <laughs> oh, what? Well, we have two, uh, I think everyone who is here is staying, uh, as far as I understand. So I'll just take yours, I think. Sorry. And then hopefully we'll come back to yeah, it, it, it was just this business of, of uh, endocytosis and whether the, uh, the membrane is still connected. And we've been working with lipid vesicles for a long time now. They, they tether very easily and they don't necessarily break off. And now you're looking yeah. for three or four fusion events in just maybe half an hour to get receptors back to the surface. And I always wondered whether if the, if the membrane is still tethered and you have an endosome, the pH drops, the ligand comes off, could the receptor go back to the membrane down a tether? That the receptor uh, recycles back, but, uh, yeah. but uh, is sort of detached from the, because from of the, the nano particle. Yeah, that might, um, that might uh, uh, happen. And for instance, uh, when we studied um, uh, the transferrin uh, uh, Q dot conjugates. We uh, we saw that um, that uh, even though the, we have had an accumulation within some endosomal compartments, uh, um, we still had the same number of receptors, uh, transferrin receptors, uh, cycling out and uh, being able to bind uh, uh, free transferrin. Very interesting. Please use the microphone. Yes. Okay, so I think we'll end there. And um, now uh, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Gerber. Um, I'll read just a few sentences to you. He's Titular Professor and Director for Scientific Communication. Um, of the NCCR, the National Center of Competence in Research Nanoscale Science at the Department of Physics, University of Basel, Switzerland, and a founding member of the NCCR. I think you can read the rest of this yourself. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I know his name for a completely different reason, and that is I was always aware of him as one of the inventors of the atomic force microscope. And I certainly know which I would prefer to have on my CV. <laughs> it's a, it was an incredible step forward in science, all science, and it's a profound honor that he would come and talk to us today. Professor Gerber. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much for having me. So, uh, what I would like to do, I would like to give you an impression on uh, the recent uh, developments in uh, uh, force microscopy in uh, life sciences and the way we have taken it uh, into personalized diagnostic based on uh, nanomechanics. So the sole reason, uh, the sole reason why we actually developed the uh, uh, AFM was to get uh, uh, atomic resolution on, on non-conductive surfaces. Uh, but people have picked on this and actually developed it in the presumably the most versatile um, uh, surface characterization tool uh, that we have today. Not only can we actually um, uh, study uh, individual atoms, but uh, we also can uh, discriminate between uh, uh, chemical bonds, and uh, that gives you a sort of an answer of the bond order in, uh, within the molecules uh, between the central rings here and, and the outer rings. So the length difference, what you see here within these carbon bonds, is uh, just about 0 0.003 nanometers. So that is really as good as it gets. So I will just highlight uh, uh, just a few of uh, the many development uh, of AFM contribution in, uh, in, uh, in, in life sciences. So, so basically people have always told me, uh, look, uh, um, uh, this is all, uh, AFM is all good, but it's far too slow and it is always sort of pushing away uh, molecules and surfaces. Uh, but this has dramatically changed in uh, recent years with the emergence of, uh, of uh, high-speed AFM. 
and um, uh, structural biologists are uh, incredibly good, good in, uh, uh, in creating a, a static uh, environment. Uh, in, uh, but uh, what is missing is actually the dynamics. So high-speed AFM uh, takes us down in the time domain of chemical activity. So the way I, it actually works, the secret is uh, uh, it just uh, works with tiny, tiny, tiny cantilevers, which just microns big. Uh, they, um, uh, you do that in the in the in the uh, in the uh, dynamic mode with frequency up to uh, between one to two uh, megahertz. That that basically uh, and the uh, Q factor within uh, fluidic environment uh, it just goes down, diminishes down to uh, about three to four, and all this combination actually leads to low noise, and it uh, leads to what you see actually uh, here with this. Uh, uh, in these different uh, images, what you can see. I have no, uh, unfortunately, I have no time to go further into that, although this is a, a very highly in interesting uh, development and it really shows the money uh, that uh, the high speed uh, AFM can monitor the cellular, cellular machinery at the nanoscale and in millisecond resolution. So, um, uh, uh, what you heard today, maybe, uh, I don't know, is this uh, false distance uh, spectroscopy of, in Rod Lim's group where he actually, uh, where they can uh, produce a sort of a mechanical uh, 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 signature uh, in, um, in, uh, in breast cancer, breast cancer uh, tissues uh, in, in from uh, uh, biopsy in, in hospital. This is, um, for example, you take um, uh, a cantilever without a tip, and then you uh, basically follow uh, the forces that are in, in, induced in uh, uh, when um, um, uh, cells undergo the mitosis, and you can uh, measure uh, the forces. This is uh, uh, shown here, and uh, I can uh, click on this uh, uh, video, and you see that when uh, uh, the chromosomes are f fluorescently tacked and the division is done. So you can basically following uh, uh, this, you also can reverse that process, of course. And uh, what we're doing at the moment is that we are picking up a, a whole cell and then operating in the, in the, in the dynamic mode and uh, are looking, uh, watching actually uh, the mass changes within in, in the molecule. So we have taken um, uh, this uh, 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 technology uh, uh, into a fast diagnostic tool uh, to detect illnesses uh, and all the way down to uh, the genetic level. So uh, this is how it, uh, how it works. Uh, we uh, distinguish between the static mode and the dynamic mode. And uh, uh, basically, uh, in the static mode, we uh, can uh, measure conformational changes in molecules. And the dynamic mode uh, tells us about the mass and mass changes. So what happens here is the uh, molecules are absorbed. They introduce a stress. And basically, that, leads, that stress leads to a, a nanomechanical bending. And here, of course, you do the mass changes is simultaneous. You can do that. That's very interesting. I can't go into that today. And um, um, what the transduction is, is converting bio, uh, biochemical process into nanomechanical motion. We do that in a differential uh, uh, measurement, gives you in, instant calibration, the re response time is milliseconds. Um, this is all done in a differential way because that takes away all the side effect like uh, uh, unspecific binding and uh, temperature drift and so on. So this is, this is uh, really mandatory to do this. So this is what we have addressed so far in these studies in cell biology. We looked at the mu mutational analysis, monitoring transcription activity, monitoring trans transcription factors, analyzing protein synthesis, and uh, what we also started to do with Rod Lim together um, uh, from the, uh, uh, f uh, f from the uh, uh, Bio Center in Basel is looking into the nuclear pore complex, which is part of the nuclear envelope. But I haven't got time to, to, do, to show you all this. 
So uh, this is what biologists uh, tell us uh, in this uh, uh, diagnostics. There should be no label sensitivity, sensitivity to down to 10 picomolar specificity, uh, single uh, point mutation in the total background, and hopefully without uh, PCR uh, amplification. So what we have done is we uh, looked into the uh, regulatory processes, in particularly in the malfunction of genes. So many malady, ma maladies are uh, uh, polygenetic, that means uh, that is uh, uh, high and um, com uh, complex interaction in between merits of, uh, of, uh, of genes and of course epigenetic goes into that and has a, 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 a big deal to say. I can't go into this, however, we teamed up with, uh, we teamed up, we teamed up with uh, Roche at that time and looked in uh, whether we can see uh, the interferon, interferon and alpha, uh, interferon alpha, uh, alpha, the state of uh, whether the genes are switched on or switched off. So this is what, uh, the way it is done. Uh, we functionalize this with ink check uh, technology, single-stranded, and it forms a tight monolayer uh, because uh, uh, this is bound covalently uh, to the cantilever surface uh, with this sulfur and this short linker. And then upon um, uh, hybridization, it squeezes in. That leads to uh, this induced stress, and you get a compressive or tensile stress. We know exactly uh, how many molecules are, uh, uh, are involved uh, using, verified that with uh, radioactive uh, uh, labeling. So uh, this is the sample preparation. This is the inducible gene we are after. We always have uh, uh, m many of uh, uh, references, as you see here. And this is a, a human aldolase um, uh, a gene and the a rat aldolase gene. This is a, just a, a mismatch of uh, four bases. So that gives us the specificity, which is actually uh, uh, what we can do down to a, a single point mutation. So uh, monitoring this uh, uh, process, we use the Aldolas, uh, Aldolase uh, housekeeping gene. This is a gene that is always switched on upon um, injection of uh, the RNA here of, uh, uh, and see, uh, looking into the interfer uh, interferon alpha if it is present. Then we get the signal, then uh, again uh, we have the reference here and if interferon alpha is absent, then it goes into an idle position. So that means, actually, we can look into these regula regulatory processes of gene, and this has been, then, uh, this work has been republished. And to assess uh, a, a patient's uh, uh, condition, uh, uh, there's a, a, a gene pool is created with uh, conventional assays, and then we look in to, um, uh, the relevant biomarkers and uh, seeing whether uh, uh, there is any malfunction in it. So that is exactly what we have done in human uh, uh, melanoma and we teamed up with uh, the Ludwig Center in uh, uh, Cancer Research at the University of Lausanne and uh, as we know um, uh, that uh, melanoma is the uh, uh, the deadliest uh, of the skin cancer, it follows a radial growth phase here, turns into a, a, a vertical growth phase, and then creates the metastasis uh, in, in, in the blood in the circulating tumor cells. So this is how it looks like in the extreme case. Uh, this is a metastatic me uh, malignant uh, uh, melanoma at the heart. So we are uh, looking into this uh, specific somatic mutation in BRAF. 50% of all the patients carry this BRAF mutation. And what you see here is a concentration dependence of that uh, BRAF uh, DNA. As I said, this is a single uh, point mutation here. Uh, um, and uh, it's the, uh, uh, the concentration dependence between the, between the uh, wild type and, uh, and the mutant. And what you can see here and what you saw here before, it actually goes uh, very fast once uh, after a buffer injection and then uh, uh, developing into uh, uh, the signals uh, is uh, very fast. We have here um, about 80 uh, um, nanometers uh, uh, at the most. Uh, uh, that again is a differential uh, deflection of what you see. 
So it follows, uh, actually, this concentration dependence follows the Langmuir isotherm. And um, uh, when we take it uh, a step further and look into the re uh, response in the total, RN in the total RN RNA background, I just show here the concentration dependence of uh, 100 nanogram per microliter and uh, 20 gram per microliter. Uh, this is corresponds to in the lower uh, nanomolar to picomolar sensitivity, but is based on the copy number uh, and the BRAF uh, percentage in total RNA. Again, this is. Uh, uh, a single point mutation here. Uh, as, a, as a reference, we just have an unspecific reference of AC, 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 but very important, what we, what we, what we also incorporate is uh, the reference of uh, uh, the wild type. So there is absolutely no PCR here uh, required in, 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 in this uh, measurements. This is uh, work from uh, um, uh, Francois Huerbel, uh, predominantly in our group. And uh, we also can do that uh, with uh, different uh, cell lines. So capturing the CTCs, melanoma uh, cells expressing this high molecular weight melanoma-associated antigen that is shown here, and we sort of uh, um, um, uh, functionalize the, uh, the corresponding antibodies, and then we, uh, it's binding uh, uh, to that, and we uh, shall see whether we are able to actually uh, monitor this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this CTCs. So the number of CTCs is very low. It's about one to 10 in a billion cell per milliliter blood. So that's, uh, it's a great challenge, actually, to, uh, uh, to do this. But uh, here is the first go. This is the capturing of, uh, 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 of melanoma cells. And uh, what you see here is uh, uh, four are functionalized, four of the sensors are functionalized, and four are actually, uh, 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 are actually references. And you see the, the differential measurement. And of course, working with whole cells, you see uh, uh, there we have uh, uh, microns uh, in, 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 in the bending. So that's how it, uh, how it, uh, uh, how it works. It goes, uh, the, the flow through the, through the cell and the, the cells are settling down. However, they're only binding uh, on the uh, prepared um, uh, antibody uh, uh, functionalized uh, uh, sensor. And so we are actually down at about uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 melanoma cells. But uh, we have teamed up with uh, Philip Breno from the EPFL, and um, they developed this uh, self-sorting uh, device. And uh, this is a, uh, hopefully a combination where we then can follow uh, a single, uh, 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 to monitor single uh, melanoma cells in the blood. So um, cell baraf was one of the first uh, uh, um, um, drugs uh, about a year ago from, introduced uh, uh, from Roche, uh, f targeting actually the BRAF, uh, uh, the BRAF patient to carry uh, the, this mutation. And um, it uh, already uh, sort of had sort of uh, side effects. And uh, also, it is, uh, all this, uh, uh, these drugs are extremely expensive. And um, uh, the life expectancy is, uh, is uh, just about a, a year or so. And then, uh, so this is just very new. This new, uh, uh, these two new inhibitors uh, are FDA approved as of May 20, uh, 29th this year. This is from another company, and apparently this has less side effects, and also the life expectancy after the treatment is, uh, is better. So um, this actually, um, uh, this statement is actually going along with uh, what Ada told us uh, at the beginning of the conference that it is very uh, difficult to uh, get the resistance, uh, to control the resistance in, in bacterial in, in infection. So we can follow all this in the outbreak throughout the world, and it's monitored in, uh, in, uh, in the daily press or in journals. And what we also need here, obviously, is if we can't handle the, uh, um, the resistance, so uh, we, we should work on, on fast diagnostic tools. 
and uh, with uh, MRSA, in particular in post-surgical environment, um, uh, it was until recently still a big problem and uh, uh, vancomycin was sort of the last resort of, uh, uh, of the drugs and uh, it uh, basically binds uh, to the mucopeptide of the cell wall and, and uh, weakens the wall and uh, due to the osmotic uh, pressure, uh, the, uh, the cell membrane uh, gives way and it leads to cell lysis. So the box gets uh, resistant just by deleting this uh, one um, uh, hydrogen bridge and it is this subtle uh, uh, difference that we can monitor uh, with uh, this uh, uh, method and technology. We've done that together with uh, Rachel McHendry's group in uh, uh, UCL quite some years ago but this is uh, uh, still a going on uh, um, uh, work. So what we're doing is actually to uh, uh, shrinking the petri dish down to the cantilevers. We functionalize that with uh, aptus and um, uh, the current uh, situation in uh, microbiological method is that you have one to, one to three days obtained uh, useful information and that is uh, dramatically increasing uh, up to 30 days in uh, uh, such as uh, 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 mycobacterium uh, uh, tuberculosis and that was also uh, addressed by other at the beginning of this conference. That is a, a, a really a, a big problem uh, at the moment throughout the world or in, in, in specific countries. And um, so this is how it works. So this is done with two different systems. Um, this is just a, a Broca bioscope uh, AFM with one single uh, um, cantilever, injection of buffer PBS. E. coli gram negative uh, bacterial PBS and then an enhancer, in L an LB enhancer medium, and then injection of antibiotics, in this case of ampicillin. And uh, what you can see is uh, that uh, the bacteria undergoes uh, uh, all this uh, 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 wiggling, what, what we call this, and then when uh, antibiotics is injected, it dies. So we have done this and verified this uh, with our system with uh, uh, the eight cantilever array, the same experiment, exactly the same experiment, and we get exactly the same result. We uh, obviously have a better statistic in this, and when you do this, uh, uh, the injection with buffer uh, uh, and then resistant E. coli, and, resist, and then uh, this uh, enhancer with the LB, and nothing actually happens. So uh, this is done uh, together with uh, Giovanni Dietler's group, and um, um, it's actually uh, uh, just uh, in breast, that means it online appears in nano, uh, nature nanotechnology very timely uh, next week. So all of this is actually bringing together the um, top-down approach and the bottom-up approach of uh, uh, the natural world and its uh, uh, self-assembly and self-organization. And uh, although this is obviously chemically driven, uh, all the gears, the, uh, the bolts and the nuts, what you see here is nanomechanics. So. Um, uh, those are the people who do the work. We uh, this is done uh, at the Swiss Nano Institute here in, in Basel. Uh, we just have a small group, but uh, all of these people are coming from a different background. So we're working in highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, fashion. Those are the people um, who are uh, uh, providing us with uh, all uh, uh, the devices, those are the people we have or had um, um, interactions, collaborations, and those are the people who have supported us uh, over the years, in particular Hans Günther, who is here, who was the first director of the SNI here in Basel. Thank you. Again, I think perhaps if there's one or two questions, immediate questions, we could take them, and otherwise we can leave it to the end. So, I think we'll, we'll leave the questions to the end. So, thank you for a stunningly beautiful talk. <laughs> Just uh, opened a new window. <laughs>